zero decimal nine. What was the last thing he said to you? I want you to keep my wedding ring and watch. And I, I said, oh, don't be stupid. You know, you're gonna be fine. Sorry. Tonight, finally, the incredible truth of MH370. So do you know where it is? Yeah, yeah I'll be, be in my house. I'll... Step by step. The whole rubber jungle comes down. Everybody's got a mask. The mystery decoded. You lose what's called useful consciousness. A significant height variation was recorded. Was that the moment we can assume that the passengers were killed? The experts and the shocking new evidence. Did they ever mention fire on board, hijack, terrorism? A revelation from a prime minister. I want to be absolutely crystal clear. That will send shockwaves around the world. It was understood uh, at the highest levels that this was almost certainly. If that's true, then that would have to point to some kind of cover up. A jaw dropping bombshell. We also tracked down the mystery woman, a woman about 20 years his junior. Maybe. He wasn't a good family man. Two days before the flight, she'd sent him a message. For the first time, the government says it looked at all possible theories. Or the heaven. The answer to the question. Where is the wreckage? The whole world is asking. This is a piece of the seat from the main cabin I'm holding right in my hands. In the history of aviation, there's never been a mystery like Malaysia Airlines Flight 370. It's so significant that that flight number, MH370, is known by most people. It was a modern passenger aircraft that took off from this runway in Kuala Lumpur on the 8th of March 2014 and simply vanished from the radars with its pilots, its crew and its passengers on board. Even today, no one knows where it is but much more is known about what happened, the alleged cover-ups, the investigative failures, and the possible motives of a pilot in command. It's a balmy evening with a moonlit, cloudless sky, and it's business as usual at Kuala Lumpur International Airport. Nothing seems out of the ordinary. Not the planes on the tarmac, or the passengers in the terminal. Among those passing through security, Captain Zahari Ahmed Shah, followed by First Officer Farik Hamid, the pilots of MH370. One a junior, the other a veteran. He has been flying uh, on 777 as a captain since 1998, and he has clocked well over 16,000 flight hours, so a very senior captain. Just after midnight, as this security vision shows, the last of the 227 passengers and 12 crew members board the Boeing 777. New Zealander Paul Weeks is among them. He's on his way to China for a new job in the copper mines. I know he sent an email to his brother <laughs> saying he had taken a sleeping tablet and had some brandy in the business class lounge and he was ready to just relax and sit back and have a nice sleep. It's the last time Paul or anyone else on board will ever be seen again. B70, at 12.42 in the morning, local time, Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 leaves the runway. Weather conditions are fantastic. It's a really dark night and it's about quarter past one in the morning. It flew absolutely normally for the first 40 minutes. There are a couple of interchanges about altitude which are absolutely standard. Malaysian 370, Lampo, radar, good morning. Climb flight level 250. Good morning, level 250, Malaysian uh, 370. Uh, this was after midnight. Um, most people on board would have had their meal and be probably going to sleep. Malaysian 370, 
all appearances were quite normal to start off with until they got to the border area between uh, the airspace in Malaysia and Vietnam. 40 minutes into the flight, a whole lot of things happened in very rapid succession. It's now 1.19 in the morning. MH370 is about to cross from Malaysian to Vietnamese airspace, which means responsibility for the aircraft is handed over to air traffic controllers in Ho Chi Minh. But before it crosses from one air traffic sector to another, a final goodbye and some famous last words. Good night, Malaysia 370, were the last words heard from anyone on that flight. And at the same time, the plane disappeared from radar screens. It's 2.30 in the morning, an hour after the plane disappears, and an urgent call is made to the crisis coordinator of Malaysia Airlines. The ops manager told me that uh, we have lost contact with MH370. How are you feeling at that point? I, I felt that something is seriously wrong. So immediately I triggered uh, a code red alert. Code red. Alert, yeah. Fuad Shiruji has worked for Malaysia Airlines for 43 years. An early morning phone call isn't unusual, but a lost plane certainly is. The aircraft uh, was supposed to land in Beijing at 6.30 a.m. So were you still hoping that MH370 would still arrive in Beijing? Yes. 6.30 a.m. in Beijing, when the plane should have landed. Delayed, flashes on the arrivals board. Panic sets in. The last point of contact is over the South China Sea, so that's where a search is launched. That was the last known location, so our assumption is that the aircraft has probably gone down in South China Sea, and uh, for whatever reasons that we cannot explain, we do not know. Fuad Shiruji's next task is the toughest of all, to find and tell family members the plane carrying their loved ones has vanished. We do not have the contacts of the families. So that was a challenge, uh, a real challenge. No one in Australia gets the courtesy of a call from the airline. Danika Weeks is told by a reporter her husband is missing. I got a call from a lady in New Zealand and she asked um, for Paul. And I said, oh, no, sorry, look, he's on a plane to Beijing at the moment. And she said, so you don't know? And I said, well, no. And she goes, there's been an incident with the plane. Sorry. So, obviously, I, I just assumed it was a crash. I dropped the phone. Uh, all I remember is running into the backyard, screaming. Jeanette Maguire gets a dreadful call too about her sister Kathy and brother-in-law Bob. I hung up the phone and then my husband's asking me, what is it, what is it? And I still, I couldn't talk. And I was just, the TV, the news, and then it was all over the TV. Relatives are staying close to airports in Beijing and Kuala Lumpur, awaiting any word of what's happened to their loved ones. Um, and they had the, the simulation of the, the flight um, on the screen. It was due to land in Beijing at 6.30am. And my two boys were just looking at just like, what's going on, what's going on, and I've said that's Cat and Bob's flight. No news, no nothing, so still waiting. And I went outside to ring my sister Eileen. Um, and as soon as I heard her voice, um, I lost it. I went from this very controlled person to I was screaming, absolutely screaming into the phone. It's Saturday morning in Canberra, and reports of the missing plane 
are filtering through to our politicians. 239 lives feared lost, including six Australians. I think I probably heard it on the news, like, like everyone else, for, uh, first of all, and then my department uh, certainly briefed me about what was happening. Um, it was reported as uh, disappearing uh, between um, Kuala Lumpur and uh, Beijing. And I thought, well, um, that's, uh, that's strange. At first, the investigation is expected to be fairly routine. There's been several cases of aircraft going down over water. Uh, the most classic one was Air France 447 in the South Atlantic. And we assumed at that point, on the absence of any other information, that it was most likely that sort of event. Australia's Prime Minister at the time is Tony Abbott. I rang the Malaysian Prime Minister and I offered Australian assistance. At that stage, we thought that the plane had disappeared somewhere in the South China Sea. There are sightings of oil slicks off Vietnam and possible floating debris, but all prove false. We have not found any wreckage, no wreckage whatsoever. Warren Truss is Tony Abbott's deputy and transport minister. Australia immediately deployed resources to assist with the search in the, in the waters uh, near Vietnam uh, and we were a part of something like 30 nations involved in that search in those early days. The search finds nothing because MH370 isn't in the South China Sea. Primary radar records and Air Force data reveal when communication is lost, the plane turns back to Malaysia and flies for several more hours. We are ending our operations in South China Sea and reassessing the redeployment of our assets. When MH370 crosses from Malaysia to Vietnamese airspace, there is a catalog of errors by air traffic controllers from both countries that coincide with some very deliberate actions in the air. The transponder was turned off, ACARS was turned off. All the communication equipment was turned off so that the aircraft went dark. That means you're not, uh, not visible on civilian uh, radar. And uh, essentially, if you're not visible on civilian radar, nobody can see where you are. And that caused a great deal of confusion and panic among the controllers in Vietnam and Malaysia. Air traffic controllers in Ho Chi Minh should have made contact with the plane within five minutes of MH370 crossing into its airspace. It takes 20 minutes before they act. No one's monitoring in a live fashion the primary radar screens. Everyone's asleep on, on the ball. In fact, it turned out that the tire traffic controllers were paying attention, saw this aircraft, but thought, oh, well, it looks like it's going back into Malaysia and decided it was Malaysia's responsibility. So if it was a deliberate tactic, that tactic worked. It confused the two countries' air traffic controllers. Two minutes after communication is lost, MH370 takes a 40-degree turn to the right and then banks left with a long and deliberate 180-degree turn, meaning the plane tracks almost directly back across the Malay Peninsula. Maneuvers only someone flying the aircraft can implement. To achieve that turn, the aircraft could not be used to be flown on the automatics of the aircraft. <clears throat> so you'd have to take the autopilot out. The autopilot would have flown itself to its program destination, Beijing. It didn't. Someone reprogrammed the flight management system computers. Data shows once the plane flies across the Malay Peninsula, it turns around the island of Penang, flies up the Malacca Strait and across the Andaman Sea. It's even seen on military radar, but no one acts. The military radar spotted the plane, but they assumed that it was a friendly uh, aircraft. And that was the reason that uh, they did not do anything uh, about it. Are you happy with that excuse? No. What should they have done? Well, they should at least check. They should have checked with the uh, civilian uh, the department of civil aviation. But what could they have done? 
Yeah, the least they could do is uh, to intercept the flight <coughs> and to find out what happened to this flight. If that was Australia, wouldn't you send a plane up? Isn't this odd? You have some plane which has no calling card flying through your airspace. If they had gone up, we wouldn't be living this nightmare. As the Malaysians lurch from one bungle to the next, MH370 continues on its journey to nowhere. I think the, uh, the initial response uh, by the Malaysian government was, uh, um, shall we say, um, it took them a while to get organised. Are you suggesting that the Malaysians could have done better? Is, is, is that where some blame I think they could have done has... better. No, I, uh, I think initially their coordination was lacking um, and uh, that's, a, that's a fact of life. Did they stuff it up? Well, I think that's too strong, but there, there are certainly cultural issues that were associated with it all. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and also, and I think this is a very, very important point, Families wanted answers to questions and no one had the answers. When MH370 first disappears, terrorism is immediately suspected. But could it be one of the pilots or one of the passengers? In the government's official report, it referred to the potential of a third party mm -hmm. being involved. Mm -hmm. What was the third party, or who was the third party? The third party could be anyone else uh, uh, apart from the crew uh, who actually entered the cockpit and took control of the aircraft. What do you think the chances are of that? Well, there is, again, another probability. There is a possibility that uh, it can happen. This idea is seriously considered. There are two Iranian citizens travelling on false passports. But that possibility is discounted by experienced pilot Byron Bailey. Well, you're saying in that two minutes from when the captain said goodnight, we'd had to get past the cabin crew through a locked reinforced door, overpower the pilots, remove a pilot from his seat, uh, get in the seat, turn everything off, and then commence a manually flown turn. And he would have to have been a very, very experienced Boeing 777 pilot to do that. All within two minutes? Not possible. Not possible. The two passengers are asylum seekers trying to get to Europe. They have no motivation or the experience to carry out such a deadly plan. And while pilot Captain Zahari has political links, no group has ever claimed responsibility for the tragedy. It's highly unlikely to have been a terrorist event. Uh, the nature of terrorism is such that terrorists will claim credit for these sorts of things because creating terror in the minds of the public is the key objective. No one has claimed any credit, no terrorist organisation, if it had been an individual terrorist who had planned this and executed it, then they would have left behind some sort of evidence pointing to this. Otherwise, it's, it's pointless. The search is expanded to cover the east and west of the Malay Peninsula, and the focus shifts to a potential fire. The second theory is that there was an onboard fire. <laughs> the captain made some attempts in this partly burnt out cockpit to try to fly it, but some controls were burnt out, the communication systems were burnt out, and he tried going this way, that way, but eventually he ran out of oxygen or just decided that the, the case was lost and turned the aircraft south where he knew when it crashed, no one was going to be hurt on the ground. So it was a, a noble attempt to move the plane away from land. That's right. So that only those on board would have died. That's right. On the 2nd of September 1998, Swiss Air Flight 111 crashed into the Atlantic Ocean off Nova Scotia. Gee, it's hard to believe that's all that's left of a cedar. It was brought down by a fire which started in the cockpit 
and rapidly spread until the aircraft lost control. All 229 people on board were killed on impact. There wasn't anything anywhere near recognizable as a flap or a flapper on an act crash. It was just millions of small bits. In their own unfolding crisis, Malaysia Airlines considers the possibility of a fire on board MH370. Maybe the plane is continuing as a so-called ghost flight with nobody at the controls. Uh, I believe that there was fire on board. The aircraft would have gone down. Uh, so uh, I, I completely rule out that theory. <laughs> There's nothing in those accident-type scenarios, fire scenarios, that explains the observed flight path of the aircraft. So, the search continues with feverish speculation, wild accusations, and not one credible answer. There was no logical place it could have landed safely without people knowing about it, so I guess we assumed immediately that it was lost. The idea that uh, uh, more than 200 people have just disappeared, literally disappeared uh, off the face of the earth, um, it's haunting, absolutely haunting. Coming up. There is this system which not even pilots knew about. In this case, about every hour, there's a satellite handshake. The aircraft will send a signal to the satellite I didn't know about that. He wouldn't have known about that. Uh, and no one would have known about that. What happened was a result of planned and deliberate action. It's very straightforward. You reach up and you press a button, then the plane will decompress. Rendering everyone in the cabin unconscious. Danica Weeks was lucky in love. She was a young traveller, out for adventure, when she met Paul, the man of her dreams. He was an amazing man, extremely intelligent, tough. He was from the New Zealand Army. Uh, we met in uh, the uh, Hofbrau house at Munich Beer Fest, uh, moved in two weeks later, and look, it was love straight off the bat. It may have been a whirlwind romance, but it led to a wedding and two little boys. Paul and Danica were together for 14 years. I'd like you all now to raise your glasses and join me in a toast to my beautiful bride, Danica. They had planned on celebrating their 10th wedding anniversary by watching this video. It was one of their many plans that would never happen. We had plans that we were going to live down the road from the boys when they were older, whether they liked it or not. And all these plans we had, and he had this amazing job, and life was good for us. It was really good. He was an incredible man. You moved in quickly. What was it about him that struck you that you thought, well, this guy's a keeper? Oh, everything about him uh, just, just drew me to him. Um, incredible man. Beautiful family man, too. I knew he'd be amazing with children. He was with the boys. Paul Weeks was on his way to China to work in the Rio Tinto copper mines in Mongolia after an induction course in Beijing. It was his first trip and he was excited. This is Paul playing music with his young sons the day before he left. Like before he, he left, we were sitting outside having a glass of red wine together in Perth and he said to me, I am so happy right now. He said, I, you know, I have you, I have the boys, I have this amazing job that's ahead of me. He was so excited, and that's the one thing I hold on to. Paul would still be alive if he caught the plane he was supposed to. Fate dealt a cruel hand after a late flight change. At first, it, he was booked on Cafe Pacific, and it was only... Oh, a day and a half before he got on the flight that it changed to Malaysian Airlines. What was the last thing he said to you? 
when he was heading off to Mongolia, he said, look, I can't wear my wedding ring and watch on site. Obviously, they're not allowed to, working with big machinery. And he said, so I want you to keep the my wedding ring and watch and uh, give the ring to the first son that gets married and the watch to the second son. And I, I said, oh, don't be stupid, you know. You're going to be fine. You'll go there, come back. Uh, <laughs> On the 8th of March, 2014, MH370 disappears. It triggers one of the biggest searches in history, from the South China Sea to the Andaman Sea, a search that's about to expand into uncharted territory, thanks to an unknown satellite. I didn't know about that. He wouldn't have known about that, uh, and no one would have known about that. There is this system which not even pilots knew about until MH370, which is that although he turned off all these systems he could turn off, there's, there's one which emits via satellite data from engine performance. And the way it works is that, in this case, about every hour, there's a satellite handshake. The aircraft will send a signal to the satellite with data on it and the satellite will respond, but then transfer that data to a ground station. In this case, it was actually in Perth in Western Australia. Every hour MH370 is flying, satellites pick up an automated ping from the engines. So the plane is clocked until one final handshake on what's known as the seventh arc. That seventh handshake produced a band, which is an arc, and that's where the science suggests the aircraft would be somewhere on that arc, but we don't know where on the arc. Data stops as the plane crosses the seventh arc, which means that's where MH370 ends its journey. It's run out of fuel. The wreckage is in the southern Indian Ocean, a few thousand kilometres off the coast of Perth. So Australia's involvement scales up dramatically. Australia had responsibility for that search and rescue area, and so we were asked to lead in the search. We had uh, several ships, uh, we had several planes, and we maintained that intensity for several weeks. Looking at an area approximately 1,500 miles to the west. And obviously Australia put uh, um, upwards of $100 million uh, into all of this, uh, even though uh, we were by no means uh, uh, the majority nation in terms uh, of those who were lost. The search covers 120,000 square kilometres, some of the most inhospitable and unexplored terrain on the planet. It's a very stormy part of the ocean. Um, the seas that the uh, ships were dealing with were at times up to 15 metre swells. We're talking about an area of the Indian Ocean that's of the order of four to six kilometres of depth. The ocean floor itself is uneven. Hills, mountains, valleys, volcanoes. extinct volcanoes, um, major fault lines, and all of this obviously in the dark. 21 aircraft and 19 ships are dispatched to the area using highly advanced underwater sonar equipment. If there is anything down there, uh, we will find it. We owe it to the families of those people to do no less. It becomes the biggest search in history and it needs an experienced coordinator. A call is made to Sir Angus Houston. I spent my whole life looking for people who were lost um, from time to time, um, so I said yes. Um, I, I didn't hesitate. But the veteran military commander dampens expectations early. I didn't see how we could possibly find it, given the information that was available at that stage. If we look at Air France 447, um, the last known position uh, was basically precisely known, and it took them 22 months to find the aircraft. The biggest problem is time. Three weeks have passed since the crash, meaning any remnants of the doomed flight 
have been swept away by currents. Vital clues lost to the vast southern Indian Ocean. In a visual search, your best chance of uh, finding anything is in the, uh, the first um, uh, 12 to 16 days. Uh, and we were well past that point. So visually, uh, we were in a very challenging situation. Debris is spotted, but it's not from MH370. Then a breakthrough. Two distinct pinger returns were audible. Significantly, this would be consistent with transmissions from both the flight data recorder and the cockpit voice recorder. It seems the mystery is finally solved. Yes, we became quite excited when, um, when they came up, most definitely. The ships using the towed pinger locator in coming days... Many subs are deployed to look for the wreckage, but nothing is found. The pings were false alarms. Again, promising leads take investigators nowhere. It's tiring and vexing work. We were really anxious to resolve this dreadful, dreadful mystery and everything that turned up that looked like it might be a clue was uh, a moment of excitement and everything that turned out not to be a clue was a moment of disappointment and despondency. Here's this, uh, this jet, um, one of the most reliable jets flying. Um, 777, it disappears and um, you have loved ones aboard. Well, what happened? Well, we don't know what happened. Um, where is it? We don't know where it is. We're searching, we're using everything that's available to us, uh, but we can't find it. Throughout it all, the families ride. Every promising high and devastating low. You know, you can only process so much emotionally in that. And it, it destroyed me. I mean, not as much as the day of losing Paulie, but when he went first missing. But that hope, and then just to be dashed every time, was just a roller coaster. By now, it's almost certain this is no accident. The innocent passengers and crew have no idea MH370 is the vessel of a sinister plan. What happened was the result of planned and deliberate action by someone who was familiar with, in detail, with the operations of a 777 aircraft. There was no one in the cabin who had the ability or experience to fly the aeroplane. So then you have to look at the flight tech, and you would say that uh, the only person who had the ability to do that and the authority to do it would be the captain. The plan started with a communication shutdown, a manual turn back, and then cabin depressurization. It's very straightforward. You reach up and you press a button, and that will mean that the compression, which comes from power from the engines, is switched off. Then the plane will decompress. The aim of such a move is usually to extinguish a fire, but in this case, to neutralise everyone outside the cockpit. I have no basis for disagreeing that if this was a planned event, that there would have been an attempt to um, find some way of rendering the, the, everyone on, in the cabin unconscious. The whole rubber jungle comes down. Everybody's got a mask, you know, and people are pulling it down and people are making sure they're putting it on, a mask on their children and, and so on. They're waiting for the cabin crew to actually sort of uh, tell them what's going on. What passengers wouldn't have known is they each had about 12 minutes of oxygen, ordinarily enough air to survive on, while the plane drops to an altitude where they could breathe normally again. But on MH370, military radar discovered the plane actually increased its altitude so passengers quickly ran out of air. It's a theory that may explain why not a single text message or call was attempted. The key to this 
is that it was about 18 minutes before the aircraft got back over Malaysian airspace, that's to say back into mobile range. And the suggestion there is that he timed it such that everybody would have run out of oxygen in the passenger cabin before it got back over land and into mobile range. And as a result of that, no one was able to make an SMS call or a telephone call. On the MH370 final report, it goes on to show that a significant height variation was recorded from over 31,000 feet to over 39,000 feet in the space of about 15 seconds. Was that the moment we can assume that the passengers were killed? You have to say that there's some doubt as to how reliable the assumptions about variation in height are. It's not to say it didn't happen, but the precision with which is, that's described, uh, I think, is, is open to question. But if that did happen, the passengers would have all died from what's known as hypoxia. Hypoxia is a lack of uh, oxygen in the blood. And one of the first things that gets affected is your brain. If you don't get your oxygen mask on in about 30 seconds, what happens is that you lose what's called useful consciousness, 30 seconds to a minute, but less if you're at higher altitude. And I've been hypoxic uh, a few times, and um, you just feel lightheaded and euphoric. It's quite a pleasant feeling, and you eventually get sleepy and go unconscious. So I guess if there's any positive in all of this, it's the realisation that those passengers probably went out peacefully. I'd agree on that, and I have personal experience because uh, when I was flying fighter aircraft, we used to go into a chamber and do hypoxia runs until you were unconscious. And uh, it's so subtle you don't even realise you've gone unconscious. The pilots, however, have extra supplies of oxygen in the cockpit in case of emergency, so they can survive longer, which also supports the theory of a deliberate rapid decompression. Zahari's co-pilot on this flight was Fariq Hamid. Hamid was a 27-year-old junior who was about to get married. But his involvement in any deadly plan has been all but ruled out. It's assumed he wasn't even in the cockpit. There's nothing in his background that suggests anything untoward. And the, to have sort of a pilot and a co-pilot both wanting to commit mass murder-suicide seems pretty unlikely. What do you suspect happened to the co-pilot? I think what he did beforehand, he wouldn't want any interference. Uh, he would have just sent him back to the cabin. The, the top of climb, which is generally a, a fairly quiet time, you just do a bit of paperwork, sort things out. He probably said to him, oh, you know, go back, get a coffee, or could you go and get something from the cabin for me? And uh, this, uh, the co-pilot's under training. He would do exactly what the uh, training captain would uh, ask him to do. And once he's on the other side, just lock the door. This has happened before. On the 24th of March 2015, Andreas Lubitz brought down German Wings Flight 9525 and crashed it into the French Alps. Lubitz, who suffered from depression, locked his co pilot out of the cockpit before steering the plane into the mountains killing all on board. Is this what happened to MH370? And after half an hour, he probably then thought, right, everyone's um, terminated down the back. He has taken out 238 problems. That's right. So he's flying a ghost flight pretty early on in, in the whole thing. There was something else brought up in the Malaysian investigation 30 minutes after the original diversion, MH370 made a slight bank right as the plane flew over Penang, with, it's now presumed, 238 dead bodies on board. Once he hit landfall over the border, essentially, between Thailand and Malaysia, he then flew along the border, went past Penang, where he dipped his wing and, um, that was his hometown, by the way. Now, it's uh, relevant that the captain was born in Penang and he was educated in Penang. 
and you say, well, this is not a coincidence. It's a little bit more than a coincidence. And uh, this is my last time I'm going to see it. And it's like uh, returning to a degree from where you came from. So it's almost as if it was a... Yes, exactly. Final farewell. Yeah. And a signal from the co-pilot's mobile phone was detected by a telecommunications tower when the aircraft was south of Penang. But there was no record of any call made. And so the question is, he would have turned his phone off like everybody else. So why did he turn it back on? And the question is whether or not he tried to maybe turn it back on to make a call, but like everybody else, passed out from hypoxia before he got back over mobile coverage. But despite what seems like a compelling case, none of the relatives of lost family members see it that way. Do you feel anger towards the pilot? No. Why not? Because I don't know he did it. I can't lay blame until I know the truth. Even though a lot of evidence supports the theory that it was the pilot? Correct. I can't do it. I can't lay blame where I don't know the fact. I was always taught um, in my upbringing not to lay blame until you have the truth. And I don't think it's fair to crucify him and his family without the truth. What do you think happened? Look, I believe there was a mechanical failure with the plane. The pilot attempted to turn it round. They all hypoxia took over and it just flew on autopilot for the next seven and a half hours. Do you ever think about what those last moments must have been like for them? I try and make them pleasant. Um, part of the counselling that we did was to come to your own ending, make up your own story that you want to live with. Mine was they've gone to sleep and they've not known about anything. I think they're aware of the tragedy that happened around them. They're, something happened, they're aware of that. But for me, the ending is they've gone to sleep. Coming up, when the flapper on was found, how did you digest that news? I was relieved that they'd found something. That, OK, we're on the way to find them now. We're nearly six years on, and the wreckage still hasn't been found. I'm not surprised. We're looking for a needle in a haystack. I'm not quite sure which haystack to look at. I don't think anyone should rest until we have found those people. six years on, and the secrets that surround the disappearance of MH370 lay buried somewhere at the bottom of the vast, wild, southern Indian Ocean. That was our last Christmas with them, so that's Christmas 2013. Leaving Jeanette Maguire still seeking answers to where her sister Kathy and her brother-in-law Bob are. It was probably pretty recent that's at their house. Can you tell so... me about Kathy? Big sister, very loving, caring, um, naughty, um, liked to have a joke, a good laugh. And Bob? Same. He was, have a chat, Bob. Uh, true Australian, had some great Australian slang sentences, let alone words. Everything was as sweet as. Um, you know, loved beer, loved wine. Kathy and Bob Lawton had just started their dream holiday. They wanted to experience Malaysia, Hong Kong, Vietnam, and they'd never been to China, so they tacked it onto their itinerary. So they went to Kuala Lumpur for, they were there four days, and that's where they caught the flight for MH370. So a five week trip, they got four days of holidays. Seriously, <laughs> Loved ones of those on board are enduring an agonising wait at Beijing Airport. It's shaping up as the worst aviation disaster in almost four years. What is it like to experience death of someone so close to you, yet there's no body, there's no evidence of someone dying? 
I've lost some really, really close people to me. Um, I've lost people through illness, age. I've lost my closest friends through suicide. I've lost family members from suicide. They're all really hard, hard to deal with, but not having a body that you can say goodbye to is the hardest thing I think I've ever gone through. It eats at you constantly. I'm still here going through this. Nobody, I know they're not coming home. I know within my own heart they're not coming home. But I've got nothing. I've got nothing to walk away from. I've got no final goodbyes. I've got no bodies in a casket that I can say goodbye to. Things got even worse for Jeanette Maguire and her family at a memorial three months later. That night, my dad got taken to hospital and he went from a very healthy 79-year-old man, fit, healthy, to having heart failure and kidney failure. And it was all from the shock. And we were very close to losing him. And I prayed like crazy and I just went outside and as I do, I sort of reach up at the stars or the sky and I said, don't you dare. Don't you dare take him as well. Don't you dare. And they didn't, thank you. I gave up work um, three months after um, March 8th, thinking they're going to find the plane. I'm going to know what's happened. You know, I'll have my memorial or Paul will come home and I'll be back to work again. I'll get back to work and whatever. That was September 2014. And still, still don't know, still back at March 8th. And it's the same for all of us because we're still stuck. Because there was no wreckage, there was always hope, no matter how slim, that somehow the victims might still be alive. But that hope was crushed in July 2015 when the first piece of the plane was found. It's clearly from an aircraft. And the it washed up on Reunion Island, east of Madagascar, weathered and coated in barnacles. I was relieved that they had found something, that the proof is they're not coming home, as sad as that is, but it was a relief that, OK, we're on the way to find them now. That relief was short-lived. Very little else was ever found. On the 17th of January, 2017, 1,046 days after MH370 went missing, the search was called off. This has been an extraordinary search effort and it's been in some of the most inhospitable oceans in the world. Not one piece of debris was found inside the search zone. I'm not surprised. The Chief of Air Force at the time said, we're looking for a needle in a haystack. Uh, we're not quite sure which haystack to look at. The agony of the unknown would go on. I spent two and a half years of my life working on this, and when you put that am amount of attention, effort, emotional connection, working with the families, all of that, huge disappointment. Kathy, Bob and Paul still remain lost at sea. And for those who survive them, pain is never far from the surface. Every morning I go out and I look up at the sky. I've done this from day one. And I always say, where are you, Kath? Where are you, Bob? Is today the day we're going to find you? And particularly this was paramount when the search was still happening. I still do this today because I know that they want to come home. I know they don't want to be where they are. They're family people and they want their family to find them. I don't think anyone should rest until we have found uh, that aircraft and those people.
tomorrow night. Uh, Tanika, I'll start with you. Just a big smile on your face now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm like the, the luckiest and the unluckiest and the luckiest woman again. To find love. The explosive new evidence that will change everything you thought you knew about MH370. So do you know where it is? Yeah, no, I'll burn my house on it. Well, we know where it is. We've always known where it is. Find out what went wrong and make sure it doesn't happen again. A revelation from a prime minister. I want to be absolutely crystal clear. That will send shockwaves around the world. It was understood at the highest levels that this was almost certainly... What did Canberra really know? So you were told about that? If that's true, then that would have to point to some kind of cover. -up. And the pilot bombshell. We'd also tracked down the mystery woman, a woman about 20 years his junior. Maybe he wasn't a good family man. Two days before the flight, she sent him a message. The government says it looked at all possible theories. Well, the heaven. Where is the wreckage? Let's get out and explore it. Tomorrow night, finally, the answer to aviation's greatest mystery will be revealed.